thrilled uh, to have Tung Nguyen here to, uh, as a part of our series here. Um, I think when, when Dean and I thought about, oh, bringing people to come and speak here at CBP, it was all like, there's this whole group of people, we love what they're doing, and they just don't work at our campus, and we never get to see them. And your name, of course, is like top on our list of those people. Um, so Tung is a professor of medicine at UCSF. Um, and uh, director of the Asian American Research Center in Health, and uh, does great work on uh, hepatitis B, among other things, which I think he's going to talk about hepatitis B today. And we're just thrilled to be able to hear more about his work and hopefully engage in a little bit of discussion. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You, um, so, so it's, it's nice to be invited anywhere, but it's great to be invited here. <laughs> you feel like you're at home when you come here, and I mean that. Center Street General Hospital is one of my favorite places to be. I wish I could be here more often. <laughs> so, well, we're happy to have you. So, um, so uh, this is a great building. I think this is wonderful that you actually have this. And I think part of my talk is going to be a little bit, because I think one of the nice things about to giving talks to disparities group in particular is you get to be a little bit more personal. I think, you know, sometimes when you do scientific presentations, like boom, 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 and, you know, we do disparities research for a lot of us do it for personal reasons. And I think it's good to do it. It out. Um, so I have a, some, you know, I was going to quote Martin Luther King Jr., but you know, you guys heard all the quotes and I think we'll decided to do something else. So, uh, epigraph this talk. No matter where you go, there you are. Uh, and this is, do you guys even remember this movie? Do you remember this movie? Buckaroo Bounds? Yeah, of course. I'm really dating myself. Yeah. Dean, you and I are dating Yes. Um, I was eating my Lucky Charms while I was watching that. <laughs> oh yeah, thanks. Uh, anyway, uh, this is something a character in that movie said, and um, it has sort of um, a couple of reasons why I picked this quote for today. Is uh, it's you know we care about what we do, so that's one of the things that this thing says. But the other thing is that we are who we are, and sometimes when we do our work, we're kind of trapped in that those perspectives, and and it's important to to remember that and. In this talk, you see how I evolve a little bit in my perspective about what to do. Uh, and then the last thing is, of course, um, just to remind myself that most of the things I'll be presenting to you is a result of collaborative work. It's not just me, but it's going to be mostly, as a matter of fact, most of the work is not done by me, uh, by people before, who worked in our group before me, and a lot of our staff. So, uh, and then the other thing is, uh, in the dream life, you need a rubber soul. This is uh, and simply, again, uh, I think uh, uh, just to talk about how I, I started at the beginning of this talk and where I ended up the end. So uh, as a researcher, I think one of the big challenges I get further and further along is just trying to be flexible and learning to grow as a researcher. And I think the challenge uh, that I'm dealing with now, uh, uh, it's really uh, not that it concerns you, but I think all researchers at some point have to think about you know, where, what's my next step? You know, where am I going from next step? I'm going to keep on doing the things that make me successful, or am I going to do something that's very different? Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's sort of where I am at this point. So um, before we get to the science, uh, we'll sort of do a little bit of preamble, and sort of I try to explain why I picked the title that I said, which was, uh, it's not bedside community. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about Asian American, just to ground uh, the science in context a little bit, and then uh, we'll describe a little bit about our community-based research uh, that we've done last 15 years, and then really get into uh, specifically about anti-SP and liver cancer, and then uh, just a little presentation on the new project that we're starting actually here at San Francisco Down Hospital, which is great. So, uh, so, so why do I do disparities research? And this is a, just a brief thing about me, but this is a blog that I did um, earlier this year for the White House. Uh, on, on, this actually was done for immigration, it wasn't done for health. You know, earlier this year, as you remember, there was this big push for immigration reform before I got to all this other stuff. And so they asked me to write this, but as I was writing this, I sort of thought a little bit about why I'm doing the kind of work that I do. Uh, this is a picture of me. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an older boy with my parents and my younger brother in Pennsylvania, uh, about a couple of years after we came to the United States uh, as refugees. Um, so, you know, my experience with uh, my parents' health care, particularly my mom's, uh, say, for example, needing me to translate for her when she goes to the doctor. Uh, or uh, her depression and sort of uh, issues that were associated with uh, immigration stress uh, sort of motivated me to go to medical school. And then in medical school, I was looking for information uh, about immigrants and about 
Asian Americans. And really, in the mid 80s, there was really nothing. Uh, nothing scientific. I mean, there was a lot of opinions, but there was nothing scientific. And I think this is not uh, an unusual example of how a lot of us who work in disparities come to it. Uh, we look for ourselves and the people we know, and we don't see them. Uh, so I got pretty good disparity. I mean, a lot of really good health services research training at Stanford, but I didn't see anybody there who either looked like me or, more importantly, uh, thought about healthcare and healthcare research like the way I wanted to look at it. So, uh, you know, that's one reason why I brought this up here is the fact that you have this place, it's just lovely. And then, you know, you're going to be doing great work. But beyond the great work, there's going you know, to be a bunch of people coming through who are thinking, what am I going to do? And they're going to see you. And they're going to, you know, see, see themselves in the kind of work that you do. And they can see themselves doing the kind of work that you do. I, I can't imagine how many really great researchers we've lost through, through the years because they wanted to do it. They went to a place and they just didn't see themselves in, in those places and they just decided to do something else, probably just as great, but, but not uh, you know, to this extent. So, um, how many people even know what these pictures are of? <coughs> this is again, I'm going to date myself. Dean might remember this. All right. So, this is, you know, in 2012, actually, the International AIDS Conference came back to the United States. Uh, it's after having been gone away for. 23, 22 years. And this is the last time it was in the United States. This is San Francisco in 1990. I mean, so this, this, this actually, um, it turns out, uh, Bob Walker, who some of you know, uh, actually ran this conference, and he just took the brunt of this. So he basically took over the International AIDS Conference, which was a kind of a plump job, I guess. And he, I think he thought he was doing just, you know, running a conference, you know inviting some speakers and yeah. getting a bunch of people to come. And he got this, you know, he got people lying in the streets, he got people doing theater in the plenary presentations, people, people running down the, uh, the way, screaming and yelling. Uh, Act Up was all over the place. So, so um, you know, at first, when I heard about this, and I was pretty young then, um, I kind of thought, took the side of the researchers. I was like, you know, why are you guys here? Why are you here bothering these people? They're doing their best. They're trying to learn how to cure this disease or prevent this disease or whatever. Uh, let them do the science, you know, let them do the science, uh, and you're just getting in the way. And then, actually, right after this happened, I actually came here, I think Dean and I were in the same uh, internship class, and uh, my first rotation was here in the Jesuit General Hospital, and walked in and picked up two young men dying of AIDS on board uh, 5 uh, and then another 24-year-old was dying of PCP in the ICU. So, I, do, I, I, I had this experience, it took me the whole residency, figure it out, but at the end of my, my residency, I was like, I'm on these guys' side. I'm not on the researcher's side. Uh, and so in a way, when I left residency, I left research because I kind of felt like it wasn't really yeah. um, So having gone through all this, uh, I think uh, I wanted to make two statements, just generally speaking. I think you probably may challenge this, but it's okay. Uh, when it comes to science, internal validity is objective and scientific, all right? Um, this is what we spend most of our time obsessing about, really, actually. You know, when you have your grant, you're obsessing about your internal validity. When you do research seminars, you're obsessing about internal validity. When you do paper, you're obsessing about internal validity. Uh, it's what makes us credible. I mean, as a matter of fact, when I go give my talk, I'm really focused on that, because it just shows my chops, you know, as a scientist. But external validity, which is what I think we care about, is, uh, I think, more subjective and political. Uh, and I, I, I sort of, this is sort of a more controversial statement that I'm making. Uh, and I'm just making it based on experience. Whenever I read my grant reviews, whenever I read my paper reviews, the generalizability piece is always the one where I go, wait a minute, where is this person coming from? Where is this person coming from? Because why are they saying this to me? And it's a very common feeling for someone who does work with a small population. Because you hear that. I mean, it's like, you work with a small population, boom, no external validity. And sort of, I sort of took that for a while. I was like, you know, yeah, okay, fine, you know, by the numbers, you're right, you know. And then I thought about it, and I said, you know what, this doesn't make any sense. Because if you were doing, let's for example, you were doing an intervention on a difficult disease, the first, who are the first people you're going to try out the intervention on? You're going to be trying out on the high risk group. You, you, know, you know, the first trial of statins were done with heart disease patients. They didn't do it with, you know, healthy patients. So to really get the science going, you got to work with the high risk group first. So if you're doing patient communications research or intervention, who do you want to work with? But the first group of people you should be working with are those who are at high risk. 
you live in literacy, live in English proficiency, cultural barriers. So if you did that study first, then your research should be more highly valid than if you do the English speaking middle class people first. Because I can take anything I do and port it to English speaking middle class people. They're the easiest group to tailor to, right? Um, but no, most research that are considered externally valid, generalizable, is done with English speakers. Uh, and then, then we're expected, our disparities people, are expected to adapt it somehow to Spanish. Or, you know. So as far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, every single patient communication intervention should start with Spanish. And that's sort of how I would see it. Because it it. it's so much easier to, do it, to go the other way than to go from English back to Spanish or to Chinese or whatever. So, um, so as somebody who's not a native English speaker and someone who worked with a uh, disempowered community, you understand the power of words. People are always listening to what you're saying uh, because, you know, first, as a non-native non English speaker, like, I'm just fascinated by how English works. But for the disempowered people, they're always reading your intention, the way that you use your word. My, my classic example was, and I never realized this, I, I walked in, to a disparities research group, and I was talking about clinical trial recruitment. And then somebody stood up in the room, uh, an African American woman who was from the community, and she said, We don't like that word. I said, Which word? You know, trial. We don't like that word. And I was like, Oh, you know, you, you have a problem with Tuskegee, or, you know, like this is the usual stuff that we come up with. And they're like, No, in my community, trial means something very different. And I'm like, Oh, that was the first moment where I realized, you know, wow, words don't really mean what we think they do. Maybe recruiting people to clinical trials just doesn't sound that good to a lot of people who are sort of oppressed. Uh, so great. that would be one example. But I think more importantly, I think this idea that our traditional research model, which has always been you know, top down, it's really a top down approach. Funders determine how you know what, what we can apply for, and then once we get our funding, then we go to the community or the patient and try to get them to to come uh, do the work. Um, there, sort of, I guess maybe five, six years ago, the NIH underwent this whole, you know, revision and brought in community and brought in bedside, and everyone was very excited about it because it was the first time they really talked about the community and stuff. But what I was looking for was these things that they were saying. They were saying discovery to implementation to dissemination, and that's the order: discovery to implementation to dissemination. And I thought, well, you know. Why is working with people and systems not discovery? You know, that's the first thing I thought. Like, what, you know, if this is a pill or a test. Why not the other stuff? Uh, but also, just the rank order of it. You know, you do discovery first, then you do dissemination. I mean, and then you do implementation and you do dissemination. Like the community is always last. Uh, and the same thing. This whole term. I mean, we use this all the time. Bench to bedside the community, and I use it all the time. And then I said, no, this, this makes no sense. I mean, why is it that we're working with people, but we're talking bench to bedside the community? It should be the other way around, right? So that's why the, the talk goes like this. And actually, when we talk about Hep B, this is uh, the, the direction that we went. Um, not, to, not to belabor this anymore, but uh, I think you know you all probably face these things. Uh, choose the studies that matter um, uh, to the communities that we serve. I think that's really important. We are always charged with uh, designing studies that are rigorous enough to address our internal living issue. Uh, I don't know if you feel this way, but I do. That oftentimes we're justifying our work to institution that try to put us in the corner all the time. It doesn't matter which institution it is, it's always like that. Um, being Asian American research is actually more interesting because even in disparities we get put in the corner. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting all the time. Uh, and then, you know, importantly, more importantly, I think we have to justify our work to communities that have experienced mistreatment from institutions. So I think we took on a very difficult job. Uh, you know, the bosses don't like us and the people we serve don't like us. And so we got to somehow make it work. And, and so that that's the job that I think and I, you know, if you're going to do that, you better really like and care about what you're doing. So let's go into Asian Americans really briefly. <coughs> so I just want to take a slight historical detour. Um, we're talking about Asian Americans in San Francisco in particular. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but uh, San Francisco Chinatown, this beautiful, lovely place everybody comes to visit, uh, was actually a ghetto for 100 years. Uh, from 1850 to about 1950, that's, uh, that's where the Chinese were kept. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can't find it hard to believe now, but up until 1950, you could actually buy a house outside of Chinatown for the Chinese. So that's, that I mean, was literally a ghetto. It wasn't just like until, you know, sort of conceptual ghetto. It was a real ghetto. Uh, 
Um, so that, that sort of just sort of sets a background for how some people in some Asian Americans of this town think about uh, the system uh, in a way. Um, and the other sort of, this is a new book that just came out. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to point this out. So how many people knew that the bubonic plague was in San Francisco? You know this? Yeah. So, yeah, you do, right? So like right before the 1906 earthquake, that was yeah, the I was, last. Like, I was taking care of some of those people. You were <laughs> While you're eating your <laughs> Uh, that's me. Um, so I, the last big worldwide wave of the bubonic plague came in the late 1800s, uh, starting out in China apparently, uh, and it actually came in through Honolulu. Um, and actually in Honolulu it was awful because because the ships were coming in from China, so they were basically the plague started out in, in, in Chinatown in Honolulu, and so they couldn't figure it out. The public health people didn't know how to deal with it, so they just went and burned all these Chinese people's houses down. They just burned them all down. And then, then the ships came to San Francisco, and of course, Chinatown being the ghetto that it was, was exactly the place where it took up. Uh, and you know, there's a whole history about how uh, the government dealt with all of this, uh, both in terms of the racial issues and the political issues, the economic issues, and scientific issues too. They tried to uh, suppress uh, the scientists at Berkeley uh, about uh, you know, pointing out that this is actually bubonic plague, for example. Um, there's an interaction of of, of uh, race politics and public health that, that I thought really kind of mirrored in a way when I was reading this, uh, the AIDS epidemic in a way. You know, so you know, 80 years later, we sort of more or less repeated the same kind of pattern. Uh, and I don't know, you know, in the next 20 years, 30 years, maybe we'll do the same thing with SARS or you know, avian flu, or whatever it is that we're really going to come down the pipe next. So, um, very briefly, Asian Americans, 6% uh, of the population, um, and they're basically the fastest growing racial group in this country, about 45% in the last 10 years, while the general population only grew by about 10%. Um, they want to point out the Asian American model minority myth. Uh, this is the idea that Asian Americans are doing really well in every way, well, in a shape and form. Uh, I just want to make sure we understood the context of where that came from. I mean, I think uh, this was coined in 1960 by social conservatives. And the, the reason why they did it was they didn't care about Asian Americans. They did it because they wanted to point out that, hey, if you know Japanese Americans, which was the Asian group they were looking at at that time, were doing so well in society, then why do we need to do anything for blacks and Latinos? That, that was their reason for doing it. Um, uh, the sort of the, the side effect or the unintended consequence was that, of course, Asian Americans then became uh, put into a, a box that's very different from everybody else. They don't get whatever resources or anything from other people. And it continues to be a problem. It's, it's amazing. Like, we live here, and I think. I do my work, so I think about this myth all the time. I think it's a given. But we'll go to places outside of this California, we'll hear what people say, and we'll say, oh, this myth still is very persistent. And it, it justified racism, I think, not just against Asian Americans, actually it justified racism for African Americans and Latinos too. This is the myth that's actually very dangerous, because uh, the fact that anyone can point to Asian Americans and say, oh, look at them, they can point to the other people and say, oh, look at you. So that, that to me, is one of the reasons why we want to break this myth um, I think you already know this, you work here, uh, about two-thirds of Asian Americans are born outside of the U.S., and about a third speak, uh, don't speak English very well. Um, but the, the most uh, populous Asian groups are listed in rank orders there, Chinese, Asian Indians, Filipino, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Japanese, but a pretty large proportion of people who don't speak English. Um, Tom, just to say one thing about the, that myth, coming from Southern California, I think that other consequences are really it's hard to build bridges across communities, minority communities. Uh, I think that's true too. I, I think uh, that's true. I think um, the, sort of my example about this, and this happens too, even like in, in disparities research. Uh, you're basically fighting for scraps on the table. Right. And when you're fighting for scraps on the table, you're fighting each other. And I think that there's that distressing uh, sort of uh, tendency, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is wrong. Like I think you should be expanding the, the pie, not fighting among each other. And, and this whole issue, you know, you don't get to do this, but affirmative action. And, School. I mean, I think San Francisco actually, the, the school redistricting uh, controversy of the last 10, 15 years is all around Asian American versus other right. minority groups, which I think is really, really terrible. Um, so uh, poverty, just to, you know, I don't want to just speak without data. So Asian Americans are poorer than whites. I mean, there's just, I mean, you may, some people would spin the number differently, but, you know, 12% of Asian Americans live under the poverty level compared to 9% of non-Latino whites. And some groups are much more than others. Southeast Asians, the group I work with the most, are fairly, uh, fairly um, uh, poor. Uh, and their, their numbers, 
But the numbers for Southeast Asian, some Southeast Asian group like Cambodians and Hmongs are basically like the numbers for African Americans and Latinos. Um, the other thing I would point out about poverty is that Asian Americans actually live in three big states, like Hawaii, California, and New York. I mean, Texas is the other one. But those three states have extremely high cost of living. So uh, the point I make out is, you know, poverty level is the same everywhere. The, the, the cutoff is the same, the income cutoff is the same, but the actual purchasing value of your money is a lot less in California than it is in California than in other places. So I would expect that Asian Americans who actually are poor a lot higher than these numbers suggest. Um, access to care, we think nowadays, so health insurance in California, so just, it just came out, they just uh, published this in their website, so I just pulled this down. So, uh, no health insurance in California, 11% of non Latino whites, 14% of Asians, 34% uh, of Koreans. Uh, they, they happen to be the group that has the most. And then regular source of care. Hopefully all these numbers will obviously change with uh, Cover California. Uh, but I think I, we have our doubts about issues around um, coverage of the undocumented, coverage of newly legal immigrants. Uh, and we have our doubts about culturally appropriate providers being available. I mean, I, I, this is just going to be a big thing. You guys, I'm hoping, are going to be helping in this situation by providing those care. But the, 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 the scuttlebutt is that a lot of bilingual providers who are older are basically can't wait to retire. Because this whole thing is all hard for them. I mean, you know, electronic health records. But as I get older, I sympathize with them. You know, <laughs> health records, you know, California, all this stuff. And, you know, we can you know, just hang on for another two years and sleep, you know. Uh, and we're going to lose a bunch of bilingual bicultural providers. The Vietnamese dogs that I know are waiting to bail. The Chinese dogs I know are waiting to bail. And we're not actually filling that gap. Or Asian students, uh, my, my experience with their language capabilities, they're not, they're not ready to take over care of uh, non English speaking patients. When you say waiting to bail, what do you mean? They just wait to retire. Wait to retire. They don't want to, you know, if, when the EHR uh, requirement kicks in, I think in 2015, I think everyone has to go to EHR. A lot of them are just going. That's it. <laughs> I'm not implementing the HR. I'm leaving. Um, so, all right. Let's switch briefly to community-based research. Um, so, um, when I left UCSF, I think in the mid '90s, uh, it was already becoming a pioneer in Asian American health uh, research, uh, primarily to the efforts of Dr. Stephen Fee, uh, Mr. Chris Jenkins, and the Vietnamese Community Health Ocean Project. If you do a series of, you do any searches about intervention in Asian American health. I would bet you that about 50% of the papers are coming out of UCSF, even back then, but certainly uh, now still. Um, they did a series of very elegant uh, community-wide intervention studies uh, that were um, culturally and linguistically appropriate to address health behaviors, primarily around uh, common things like cancer screening and uh, tobacco control. Um, so since then, uh, we continue to do community-wide interventions whenever we can. These, uh, one of the things that happens with these papers that we present is uh, the quasi-experimental study design is actually tricky, right? So, you know, as, as well-trained scientists, you know that there are a lot of problems with internal validity with quasi-experimental study design. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Larry Green's very fond of, of talking about this. Uh, you know, we sometimes do our interventions to fit the, the, the study design that we want rather than the other way around. We just pick the study design that fits the intervention we want to do because it's so much harder to, to come up with the intervention you want to do and then figure out a study design that works. Uh, and so, you know, I think what Steve did was say, you know, the heck with it. This is the intervention I want to do. This is the study design that's appropriate for it. And so, okay, there are issues around internal validity uh, that you can challenge and people do challenge. Uh, but, you know, why would I want to do a study I don't want to do just because it's valid? <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. So he wanted to do community-wide study. So he picked quasi experimental to do study design. And, uh, that's what we did. Uh, on the other hand, um, sorry, uh, um, you know, the other problem with disparities research, and this happens all the time, I, I, you know, you go to conferences that are not disparities oriented, and you sort of feel like people think you do inferior science. Uh, because there, you know, there, was, there was a time when that was actually probably true, because we were just starting out. We were just trying to figure out what we were doing. Uh, we were sort of uh, doing sort of you know, uncontrolled studies, and we were doing snowball sampling or convenient sampling because that's what we had. <laughs> uh, and so there's this feeling that somehow disparities researchers can't do great internally valid science. 
And we just wanted, I just wanted to show you guys that we can do randomized controlled trials. I mean, we, as a matter of fact, we do probably more community-based randomized controlled trials than pretty much any other group. Uh, not just we, but the people that we work with in Asian American Health. And what we want to say, the, re the point, the reason to throw this up is to say, look, there are difficulties in working with uh, minority communities. There's just no question. You know, they're going to have a problem with randomization. They're going to have a problem with, uh, you know, uh, usual care controls. Uh, you're going to have a problem recruiting people. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. You could do it, and the way to do it isn't to walk in and decide to do it. The way to do it is to set up relationships and community and do all kinds of stuff beforehand. Uh, and, and so we presented this to other people, and they'll say, well, you know, yeah, you've been doing it for 20 years. Well, yeah, that's the reason why we can do it, is you've been doing it for 20 years. And the first 10 years, you were doing this kind of study design, uh, and now the community trusts you, you can do this kind of study design. So I think uh, sort of to tell a story where uh, you, you set up this trust and then you get into doing all this stuff. So we did a series of studies on the health workers um, in cancer screening. This last study uh, actually is interesting. It's a healthy colon, healthy life, which is actually uh, led by Judith Walsh. It was actually a, uh, it's interesting, it was a three-arm, two populations, so six different groups were being tested. So Latinos and Vietnamese Americans uh, who were not screened for colon cancer. And so she did a study on telephone counseling, brochure, and usual care. So it was like a six, you know, a, a, a two by three table of enrollment. And she actually had pretty good outcomes on it. And again, it was interesting, she did it in Spanish and Vietnamese, but not, I mean, she had a little bit of English, but she did not do it in English. And I kind of felt like, no, this is great. You know, anybody can do this because everything that we did in Spanish would just translate to English and just do it that way. Actually, it's already been translated. We have to work together, so we have to have it in English in the first place. So We currently have a bunch of community-based RCTs going on. Uh, we actually finished the Vietnamese study uh, that was led by Bang Nguyen at the Cancer Prevention Institute in California. He's writing the papers up. We're in the middle, or we're actually toward the tail end of the Chinese project that I lead. Uh, in which we actually inject uh, an element uh, that's very culturally uh, centered with traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, we're currently doing a three-site trial uh, with Filipinos, Hmongs, and Koreans. Um, we actually have a collaborator now who works with nail salon, and so now we're taking this model into a business setting, which actually is very interesting because the political dynamics and the business dynamics become very, very important, and I'm learning all kinds of stuff that we're doing this. Uh, and then uh, we just got a new grant to do uh, family-based with health workers. So this is actually an interesting idea of you don't work with an individual for a family problem, you work with a family for a family problem. So the intervention group actually involves both the smoker and the, the family member. Can you say a little bit more about the Chinese, um, Chinese traditional medicine? So uh, the way that I built my, R my R01 was uh, sort of understanding how the NIH worked is we put a randomized controlled trial of lay health workers that we base on everything else that we've done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that, that felt good to them, you know, this is you know, strong science and so on and so forth. And then in our second theory aims, we had one aim where we said, well, we're going to prove that this works, but we're going to try to prove that this works in the RCT. And the secondary aim was, well, if it does work, how does it work? So we have this mixed method sort of approach. And in the third aim, what we said was, well, you know, lay health workers are a very poorly defined group of people. There's no, like, no, you know, you have to be a certain kind of person to be a lay health worker. So why don't we think really creatively about what, what it means to be lay? Uh, you could be, you know, I think in the Spanish community, for example, they do go to a lot of traditional healers. I, you know, I'm sure a lot of people what I've heard about is they'll go to you know, traditional healers. And those people aren't certified or anything, but they're providing some kind of health care. Uh, why not think about them as a traditional source of uh, health information for biomedicine? Not, not a, they can continue to deliver whatever it is that they deliver that they're trained to do, but we want to train them to deliver uh, about colon cancer screening. So we actually worked with four um, TCM providers there, mm -hmm. acupuncturists and herbalists. So we first had to figure out whether or not they even wanted to do this. They do. We had to figure out whether or not the patients wanted to hear about it from their tradition. Like, you don't go to the herbalist and go, what about colon cancer screening? Right. <laughs> that's, that's a weird idea, right? And we did it. And that's like, oh yeah, that'd be cool. You know, we don't mind. Because I think the, the assumption that people have about traditional medicine in any kind of culture is that somehow people you know, segregate them. Yeah. But human beings don't segregate things. They put things together, and they kind of flow back and forth, and this was fine. And so we actually done a tiny little pilot with like 60 patients. Mm -hmm. We haven't analyzed it to whether it works or not, but it clearly is feasible. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of uh, using traditional, not not sort of setting up a sort of a, because uh, you know, I hear a lot, you know, they go to traditional healers and these bad things happen. Right. 
you know, you kind of want to say, well, no, you know, we can try to control that a little bit by talking to them, mm -hmm. seeing what they want to hear about. And they're lo they want to work with us because they're, in a way, it gives them a little bit of credibility, more credibility. Uh, and so, uh, but they're also very open-minded. They're there to take care of their patients. So, so um, what am I working on now? I think the big things are, uh, how can we create effective systematic interventions that can remain community and patient-centered? I think this is the big thing. Uh, as a general internist, I worked at UCSF, and now there's all kinds of quality improvement stuff going on. It's all very system-based, you know. You send you know, this out, you order this test. And there's no consideration of patient-centeredness, right? I mean, like I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm supposed to order, you know, urine microalbumin on all my diabetic patients. And I'm like, I know that 25% of them should be getting urine albumin, and some of them, don't, you know, they're never going to want to go on dialysis. Well, you, you think about all this stuff, you're like, why am I ordering it for all these people? There's no patient-centeredness going on here. But I still do it in a way because that's the system and that's what we're supposed to do. Does, that, does it sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to be like, you know, I would sit there with the list and I'm going, oh, this person should get it, this person should get it, this person, because I know this person doesn't want it. So, and after I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, this is the system intervention, just let it go. And then, if, you know, when is the time going to do the mission? But, but that's, that's not right, right? You know, like, well, how can we do system based intervention that somehow takes into account what patients want? Um, and then the other thing that I really want to this is really, really important to me, is how do we bridge community to clinical settings? It turns out that one of the biggest things about community-based intervention is sustainability. Like, after you do it, and it works, and we've shown it works for multiple different things, how do they keep it going? Uh, and the way it works in clinical medicine is very simple. You know, if it works, someone pays for it. You know, CMS comes in and pays for it, and that's how things get sustained, right? Well, that budget is huge. You know, CMS budget is, you know, I forgot what this was, like trillion. And the budget for community based organizations are very tiny. They're running around chasing money. Uh, and one other thing I want to do is to say, look, uh, we need to get the community connected with the clinical setting. Rather than us creating all kinds of things within ourselves, why can't we connect ourselves with a CBO that already knows how to do this stuff, you know, contract it out to them so that they can do this work and you don't have to worry about it anymore, but that gets paid. All right? So that's sort of the the dream, in the dream life, you know, the soul kind of thing. But it turns out, you know, there's this new thing, I don't know if you guys seen this coming out, where there's a possibility that CMS will pay for community health worker to manage chronic diseases. So this just came out, like, the, the regulation just came out, like, a month or two months ago. Or something like that. So I was like, wow, this is great. So now, what, is it, what is the regulation saying? Yeah. It doesn't say exactly that, but I think it will pay for you to do things that you need to maintain chronic disease. Right, care coordination. Yeah, so, so the, the implication is that if you came up with a program with community health workers or something like that, that, that might work uh, better. Uh, but then the question that comes up is do we then go out and hire more community health workers or do we do something different institutionally and collaborate with community organizations? That's sort of the thing that I, I want to work on next. So let's switch here into hepatitis B. Um, so worldwide, there's 10 to 50 million people infected. 40% of them get liver cancer, cirrhosis is another problem. Uh, it's the most common cause worldwide at least uh, of liver cancer. And it, it's very costly. It's, it's basically quadruple in this country in the last 15 years, the cost of HPV. Uh, and you know, both the Institute of Medicine and the Department of Health and Human Services actually come out with these, these statement papers uh, uh, to prioritize control of viral hepatitis. Uh, in their prioritization is both B and C, uh, but uh, they both were done. just did it the last two or three. Tell, tell me the second bullet point. Um, yeah. Could you could you just extrapolate a little bit on, on that? The distribution of like how many of that forty percent get liver cancer? Is that symptomatic cirrhosis and what the other sequelae? Because that that just I mean that just seems like that's I want to defer to my okay my dollar right. And you thought what was I here for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know you're here, I can stop. Bagels. I was like, I knew they were going to ask me questions about liver. <laughs> You can also develop cancer without having cirrhosis. Okay. Um, however, still within the patients who do have uh, cancer, most of them are cirrhotic. So mm -hmm. that is not necessarily an issue. And um, essentially, the, the reason why we sometimes get some this 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 
disparity with regards to uh, cancer and um, liver cancer among the younger healthy groups is that this notion that you know, patients who are older or have had disease for a much longer period of time are the ones most at risk for cancer. And so the younger groups are not necessarily getting as screened. Um, so I guess you know, we have about 25 to 40% of the patients developing cirrhosis in, in, over a long time period, mostly those who um, have been exposed to it as, as children, such that you know, by the time they're in like their 40s and 50s and past 50 years of disease. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, just a constant old setting. But, um, but if you have a child who had vertical transmission of hep B, mm -hmm. what is the likelihood in her lifetime that she'll get cancer? Right, so that's about 1 to 4%. Uh -huh. yeah. One to four percent per, per year. Per year. year? <coughs> after after, 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 yes, after, after age 30 four. Five, 35 is about the right age. Wow. Yeah. That's not good. No. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's one of those cancers that actually strikes. One of the reasons why I think a lot of people got interested was that the epidemiology of FB in Asian Americans because of sort of maternal fetal tra uh, transmission, and maternal child transmission is different. Uh, it's very, different, very different. Sam So works at uh, Asian Liver Center. He's, you know, he worked actually. He's a liver surgeon who worked in, like, in the Midwest. And he was like, he was doing whatever liver surgeons do in the Midwest. He was like, this is, this is not right. The people are not saying, uh, why are they not caring about liver cancer in younger people? Because the, the epidemic in whites are very different. They don't get liver cancer until their 60s or 70s. And the Asians were showing up in 25. I mean, in Taiwan, they were showing up in 25 and 30. Because it's well, vertical the, transmission, yeah. so they're living for bad years. Well, no, yeah. one is the year, but I think it's the age, what, the, I think it's when you get exposed. My, my understanding is when you got exposed and how that gets, uh, the chronicity gets, uh, the rate of chronicity gets higher when you get exposed as a child or baby. I see. So if you get hep B as an adult, a lot of people in healthcare actually not too long ago got hep B as adults. Uh, they don't get, a lot of them don't get chronic hep B. Mm -hmm. uh, but the babies and the kids do, they get mm -hmm. higher rates of. Uh, so it's both yes, the number of years of there's vertical transmission and that some, there's some vulnerability about being infected when you're young. young. Yeah. Uh -huh. The other thing that's now rising is the issue of, besides just the Asian American, uh, in looking at other sort of racial groups, is a combination of other factors that are becoming so much more prominent in more of the you know, Western countries, but also in the Asian societies as well. And that being diabetes, uh, you know, being overweight, so fatty liver, et cetera. So now there's, you know, there's a much more yeah. I mean, I, you know, we focus on Asian American because that's the highest risk group, but actually it turns out that some of the issues of liver cancer for the Latinos and African so there is a disparity. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't talk about it, but there's a disparity. So um, this is a map of worldwide prevalence of type B, which I might as well just show you the places where it isn't <laughs> an endemic. But uh, you know, Asia clearly, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, big uh, pieces of South America, and of course uh, uh, Alaska and sort of the uh, Alaska area. But also, you know, I'm always struck by the intermediate area, which is Russia and Eastern Europe. And uh, and Brazil uh, in particular. So basically, you know, I, the way I think about it now is most immigrants in this country are at risk. I mean, I don't necessarily want to think too hard about that, but you know, they're at risk because let's think about it, about screening them. But certainly Asia is the group that we're looking at. Uh, and this is cancer death rates. I just wanted to point out that there are very few cancers that are actually rising in death rates. We've done a pretty good job. I don't know where it is that we've done, but mostly probably smoking. Cessation, but mm -hmm. liver is the one that's the reason why they're prioritizing this is they're seeing this as being one of the big areas. I think the, a big part of this epidemic in this country is probably Hep C, uh, not Hep B, but they're both the uh, I just wanted to show this, which is liver cancer incidence in men. The women's graphs are kind of very similar but lower rates. Uh, whites, very low number, 6.7 per 100,000 cases a year. Uh, API goes up to 21. Uh, and then some of the other groups, particularly Southeast Asian and Pacific Islanders, they're just huge. Uh, the rates were actually, say for example, for the Vietnamese and liver cancer, it's about the same as the rate for Vietnamese and colon cancer. So for us, it's actually as common as common cancers. Um, and the disparities is about 8 to 12, which is a magnitude of disparity that you just don't see uh, anywhere else. So, uh, clearly, this prioritized areas. Uh, so most, are, a large number of the two, uh, two million Americans with HEPI are Asian. Uh, in some groups, uh, the rate of chronic HEPI is about 10 to 15%. So it's, I think these studies are not being done as much as they used to be done, but uh, 
we, we use data, for example, I think most of them are like 15, 20 years old, but um, it, it's about one, in, we, we quote number one in seven, so it's about 15%. Uh, about one third of them had never actually had screening, do we know that they had FD? Uh, and we know that the cancer is preventable by the vaccine. Uh, I think this may not be true, no, I mean, it's still true that most Asian American adults have never had the vaccine. We've had universal vaccination for quite a while now, I think 15, 20 years now. So that, that age cohort's gonna uh, not be at risk as much. Uh, before I, I came back to UCSF, uh, Steve did this nice study uh, looking at uh, hepatitis B vaccination. So it's kind of hard to think about this, but in, 15 years ago, you couldn't even necessarily promote screening for hepatitis B because people didn't believe that it was necessary. The one that they believed was necessary was hepatitis vaccination. Everybody bought that because the studies out coming out of China and Taiwan in the 1980s, it even really showed that by vaccinating people, you decrease the rate of liver cancer. And it was just these lovely, lovely studies. And so, you know, the government decided to implement universal vaccination. And so Steve said, you know, well, let's take a look at these populations and see if they're actually getting vaccinated uh, and what can we do about it. So he, he did this nice. Uh, quasi-experimental study where he basically took three communities, uh, and Vietnamese Americans, so he did a media education campaign in one in Houston, he did a community mobilization campaign, which is basically getting people out to events and things like that uh, in Dallas, and then they compared it to a neutral care group in Washington, D.C., and he showed that you could actually get people to get more vaccinations uh, among their kids. And so they worked, they mostly targeted the parents, right, but the kids got uh, vaccinated, uh, so that was good. He also actually did, uh, he worked with the CDC on this project and they actually did a cost effective analysis to show that these interventions were cost effective based on the kind of rates they were given. So we got funded to do uh, a program grant for the NCI on community based interventions to promote hepatitis B testing. Um, the PI was Dr. Moon Chen over at UC Davis. Uh, I was leading the Vietnamese project here at UCSF and Roshan Bastani, who is just a huge uh, disparities researcher. Uh, um, led the uh, Korean uh, intervention. So these are the three projects that we worked on. Uh, we basically, uh, to, to do this program, we have to kind of, can't be the exact same thing, obviously. So uh, we worked on the Vietnamese adults uh, doing a quasi-experimental study uh, looking at Northern California versus Washington, D.C. Uh, and we used a media campaign as our intervention. Uh, the Davis group uh, worked with Hmong Americans uh, and they did a, uh, individual RCT of the health worker outreach. And the Korean group uh, did a group RCT of Korean churches uh, to promote uh, these three. So our project was, uh, this our team, with me and Steve, and uh, students to in Jimmy, Jimmy. And the, this project was, the main thing was to raise awareness uh, about hep B and hep B cancer, and then to increase the rate of hep B screening uh, in Northern California among the adults to the education campaign. Very simple study design, free intervention survey, population-wide, uh, do the campaign or just watch the control group and then do a population-wide post-intervention survey. Uh, clearly very you know, limited in terms of um, scientific validity. So most people call this an end of one trial. I, I don't like that because it's not really an end of one, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, uh, but it's technically correct that it's an end of one trial. It's very hard to do, you know, I mean, the, the way to design these studies, obviously, is to take, you know, a bunch of communities, randomize them into intervention and control, and then do the studies. But who's got the money to randomize six communities and do three intervention communities and three control communities? That's the kind of money that takes uh, years and years to plan. I think the last time they did that kind of study was uh, the Stanford Five Cities Project. Uh, and after that, when they didn't get the outcomes they wanted, they stopped funding all that stuff. So. We just do this kind of study. So. Um, just quickly about uh, what we found. This is a baseline survey data that we published in Jinjin. 93% um, responded. This is a telephone. We call them out. Uh, we use a sampling method called certain based because it's very hard to actually do random dial uh, with certain Asian groups. Because, uh, I can give the example. If you random dial all the leads in the phone book, you won't get mostly Chinese. Here you get mostly Chinese, but in other places you uh, but you, we, we, Vietnamese actually is different. There's only you know, many, 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 probably. So there's only like 
55 certain so that captures like 90 percent, 95 percent of the population, and they're all mostly unique. They're very they don't there's no overlap in the group. So we use that kind of methodology. Uh, we found that only about two thirds uh, had hepatitis B tests. Uh, we looked at knowledge of hepatitis B transmission. The top three are the wrong ones, and for those you know, they didn't get correct. A lot of people had mis uh, misinformation about how hepatitis B was transmitted. We, I, we think that a lot of this has to do with, too, the fact that most people just didn't know the difference between one kind of hepatitis versus another. Like, they got confused between A, B, and C. So this is, may not be that they don't know how to be transmitted, they just don't know the difference between B and A, for example. So, um, but even for the common things, uh, uh, like sexual transmission, it's about half of them. And then we did the multivariate analysis of this and, um, to find out you know, who, who was getting tested. Uh, and you know, interestingly, the two things I wanted to point out was if you look at years in the U.S., there's actually a, a weird disparity because usually disparities work the more recent you are, the recent you are, the less likely you are to get the whatever it is that you're supposed to get. Well, this one, if you live there longer, you're less likely to have had the test done. And the other one is the language one, where if you speak the native language more, you're less likely to get the test. But here, it turns out you're more likely to get the test. So this actually points out the idea that the hepatitis B efforts have been focused on immigrant populations and in language. And so, you know, if you were you were here 20, 25 years, you're not hanging out around with those kinds of efforts. So you're just not hearing about it as much probably. That's so what I think. This means younger people were less likely than older people? Yes, to get tested. And is that an access issue? Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. I think it might be, again, Because um, it uh, seems to go opposite to your years in the US, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if that's related to age. Yeah. But also, just might be an assumption that's already happened, you know, for these pro providers. I was going to say that when yeah. we looked at what are some of the issues, providers were actually tending um, to choose the older patient population. That's what we To test? Yeah. We, we may just have gotten may have been at the message. Point, no, the the message. assumption may have been that they've been at risk or something like that. I mean, the other thing is, you know, some people do know that there's been vaccinations, universal vaccinations, and maybe they're like, I don't need to test. Mm -hmm. so, we, but we do have to test, even with universal vaccination, because if you don't test a child whose mom was born, that shouldn't happen anymore, but if you test a child whose mom had FB and you vaccinate them, it doesn't mean they don't have FB, and they still have FB, so it's something we talk about. So, we, we actually did a sort of a couple of models, and we added then the models about communications, uh, and we found that the odds ratio of that just you know, uh, through the roof. So if the doctor tells you, no, no matter what it is, if the doctor tells you to get the test, you're much more likely to get an odds ratio of 4.6. And of course, if you're empowered enough to ask for the test, uh, you've got an odds ratio of 8. So these are actually the, the findings that sort of drove us to our next project. But the, the first odds ratio up on top was statistically significant? I'm sorry, say again? The, the top odds ratio of 1.41, was that statistically Yeah, they, all of these are statistically significant. So and, and do, you have a, we, yeah. do you have a sense as to whether or not the media can't, this is the media campaign, right? This is not yet. This is just pre-intervention. This is pre-intervention. Pre pre-intervention. Yeah. Got it. But even then, you know, what, well, you even said, what you're seeing is that California is more, you know, I got the more California effect. I got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. When we saw this data, we were like, oh, yeah. we're not surprised. <laughs> we're not surprised, but we're not happy. <laughs> so, you know, so, yeah. so you do the research and you find out stuff. So. Yeah. Um, so we did, they came in anyway, so we went ahead. Because uh, we were, we said we were going to do it. So um, <coughs> the typical sort of media education campaign stuff, these are things that you've seen before, print, um, newspaper ads, uh, radio, TV, videos. Uh, and of course, we did provide links to places that we're offering testing or community health clinics. Uh, just to, I'm not going to show a lot of materials, but just to let you know that the radio and the TV, that sort of mirror the newspaper ads I'm going to show you. Yeah, let, you know, like any media, good media campaign, we have a logo. This is kind of culturally appropriate. The top word is Vietnamese, Viet Britain, and Viet Vietnamese. And the bottom is just a stamp of approval. Um, we had some pamphlets, we had newspaper ads. I just wanted to read a couple of them to you. So this is Dr. Wee who works in uh, the community. Uh, and he says, Wee Vi Gobi Ben Vim Gan you know, do you have hepatitis B? And then he explains a few things. And the other one says, but uh, so basically it says, uh, can you uh, treat hepatitis B? It was a very important point that we wanted to make that you could treat hepatitis B. So, um, 
We also focus on the young groups. Uh, this guy over here says, bệnh viêm gan B có thể gây chết người, so that means uh, hepatitis B can kill you. Uh, and actually, it's amazing because he's a little cancer survivor. First of all, there are not, not many of them. Uh, and then second of all, we get get an Asian person. Cancer is still very stigmatizing in the Asian communities in particular. To get anyone to stand up in public and say I've had cancer is amazing. And then to have him actually go to the media ad, and he actually was in the TV ad too. So that was just for us, you know. Sometimes we do these things for the reason that we're doing it, but we also want to do it to destigmatize things. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's really good. I actually was going to ask about stigma, and I know that there's, it's interesting that there's a widespread cancer stigma. Is there a particular stigma around Hep B and C? You know, we didn't find thing? it in Vietnamese, but we're hearing about it in Chinese. Because in China, actually, you, if you have hepatitis B in China, uh, you're discriminated against. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So people don't want to get tested for that, those reasons. So different Asian groups have different experiences with it. I don't think the Vietnamese have the same issues about hepatitis B. They were actually fine with talking about it, uh, showing up for testing and all that stuff in public. So that was an issue. But cancer is definitely stigmatized. People will not tell you that their parents died of cancer. Uh, a couple of other things. A few more ads. So we try to model the doctor-patient relationship with how to ask your doctor for the test. It's a very important concept for Asian a lot of the immigrants are very, very, very you know, feel this way about the patients you see, but they don't want to talk to you or ask you for stuff because they feel very, very you know, they're scared to, to really bring it up. So. Tom, yeah. um, this is a huge amount of work and it's amazing, but just to think about it from a research perspective, how did you determine what kind of statements may make sense to promote in the community? Is it from prior experience? We did a lot of focus groups. A lot of focus uh, groups. We had a lot of community and, input. Got it. So, and there were some studies that sort of suggested, like, like for instance, our base. We use our baseline survey to sort of tailor a little bit about what we were going to do uh, in terms of that. The one thing that we did do a very good job of this younger age group. We were having a really hard time. You know, young people were very hard right. to reach with health yeah. emotion messages, uh, and so we were creating different things. But uh, I kind of felt like we didn't really get as much done with that as we could. And, and the, I mean, there are really three. Three issues you're talking about here is there's screening, and then there's screening for vaccination, and then screening for positive tests to treat. Yeah, this is only about screening for for knowing whether you for have vaccine, or just for knowing whether you have it or not. And, and, but the whole thing about the pills and the well, I think because we surprised we, to see it. Well, so so we talked about this to our community, and they're like, well, the only reason why people may not want to get tested is they're afraid that if they get it. They can't I see. So, so those are means to kind of de yeah to address the idea of stigmatism. I mean, um, a fatal. No, yeah, fatal. Right. I, mean, I don't like that term. There's nothing they to do with that. Yeah. But the primary rationale is to screen. No, to no. treat. Well, I, I think you know things have evolved, but I think you want to know whether you infected for a public health reason because then the people around you can be tested yes. and can be vaccinated. So that I think is one big reason to screen. Mm -hmm. right. Second big reason to screen is to can then monitor them for sequela treat them early if that happens right. to be the case. I mean, a lot. And then the third is, if they qualify for treatment, treatment's good. But we don't so. routinely, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't routinely screen non-immigrant populations before we vaccinate. So, right, vaccinate. Because, 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 of, because there isn't such a high prevalence. That's right, but right. that's right. So, 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 so one of the reasons to, not, right? one of the reasons So that's why I'm saying it's not, we don't, we don't screen the vaccinate. That's Although I, you know, among the immigrant population, among non-immigrant population, no, no, I'm thinking about immigrant. But here, but I don't. I think the rationale, like you're saying, even if our goal is to vaccinate, you want to find out whether they have. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. The the, the screen. The, there's two different debates, but I think the screening debate is about the person who already has it. So who has it care. and the trans. Yeah. yeah, you can take care of it. Yeah. The transmission. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the vaccination debate actually been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us feel like you should vaccinate. Yeah. So if you're going to be Asian and you're going to have sex with Asian people, I mean, yeah. you know, you should be vaccinated. Right. But I don't, you know, that's always been a, a debate about, right. that, that recommendation has always been a big thing. Like, should we vaccinate all Asian American adults or all people who come from endemic area who are not infected mm -hmm. and who are not immune? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, the, the kids have been, that's done. You know, all the kids are getting vaccinated no matter who they are or where they come from. Right. Uh, but the adult has been a debate. That's all. But no, this campaign was all about screening. It's not about vaccination. Mm -hmm. We did say, you know, if you don't have it, that's good. You know, we have messages like if you don't, because we sometimes forget that we test someone and they don't have it, they're not done, right? Yeah, you don't have absolutely. it, but you should talk to your doctor right. about getting vaccinated. Right. 
So we do tell them to do that. Yeah. Uh, we had a website, uh, a few different things, and then I'm just going to show you the post uh, study. So this is the so our pre-intervention surveys. Uh, so remember that we call each community uh, uh, randomly through the survey list before and then after campaign. Uh, these are the response rate we have. They look awful. And I hate calculate response rate for population-based telephone <laughs> like, I'm looking at, and you know, these, these would never pass muster in any kind of JGM pen of paper. And I'm like, 29%, this is just awful. Uh, so we report what they call the cooperation rate, which look, always looks a lot better, because once you get a hold of them, it's better. Uh, but it turns out, I went, I actually went back and I said, okay, so we we're doing such a terrible job. You know, what did the BRFS look like? What does the CHIS look like? They look like this. Yeah. So basically what they're, we're saying is population-based yeah. is no longer population-based. So in a way, that's what the method, I mean, a lot of people have been struggling with So anyway, so did we did find. Did you use landlines? Uh, we only did landlines. We 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 went. Into, we actually worked with some fairly experienced uh, telephone survey people, and we went back and forth on the cell phone issue. You know, clearly, you know what we learned. Uh, I don't know what you've learned in other populations, but I think what we learned was younger people and men, in particular, young men in particular. At that time, this is like five or seven years ago, were very likely to have cell phone only, no landline. Because that was a group that we worry about. Right? We don't worry about the people who have both cell phone and landline, because theoretically that should be sampled. But it's the ones who stop having landlines. That was the issue. And I think it's much worse now than it was before in terms of that. So uh, in a way, I've sort of given up on this methodology, because I just don't trust it anymore. So uh, so I don't know what they're doing with cell phone sampling now. I mean, I, I think that they, I don't think they've gotten to figure it out. I haven't looked at this in three years since we finished this project. But I don't think there's any new way to do it. There are all kinds of things that people come up with to sample young people. Because that's a group. If you're going to do a population-based study, that's always the challenge, is getting all these young people. And, you know, they have these things where they pe have people sign up to be part of a research group, and this and that. And I just, I don't, I don't have a good solution. Anyway, so we found that, that they, they, in the intervention group in Northern California, they were more exposed to the newspaper articles and ads. But both communities reported increases in exposure to all kinds of media. And so this is the danger of doing community-based interventions, is that there's always all these secular trends going on. Uh, and you know, you can't stop people from being activated by their community when they want to do it. So they had all this stuff going on in DC too. So, so we looked at, uh, these are people who have not been screened, did you plan to get screened uh, pre and post. And so intervention, they went from 26% to 35%. That was a significant increase. The control group sort of went down a little bit. And there was a difference in intervention in planning for the screening. But the main outcome, which was having had a text be screened, they both went up. They both went up significantly. They went from 65 to 73% in the intervention, and 56% to 66% in control. But there was no, no intervention effect. We did a multivariate analysis to prove to ourselves that or the intervention of, uh, effect did, did not exist. Health insurance had some effect, so access had some control for these other things, actually. So, um, it, it posted, I mean, it, when we combine all the samples, the other stuff that I told you about sort of fell out, you know, the language fluency, immigration stats, and so um, But health insurance, I mean, have a family history, which makes sense. And then if you were exposed to any kind of media elements, we, 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 we were able to show at least that media somehow works, whether or not our campaign worked or not, it didn't work. Um, but it, if you did media, there wasn't and in a way, you know, these are small odds ratio, but they're kind of like the odds ratio you see a lot for these kinds of interventions. You know, one point two, one point two, And this is actually per additional element. So the, each element that you're exposed to, we have like six or eight elements of measure, TV, radio, and things like that. The more you do, the more likely the more you get tested. So, so at least we were able to show that. Um, and I was uh, finished by talking a little bit about how we went from the community to the bedside. So, um, did you do uh, direct mailing? No. In addition to calling? Uh, oh, you mean about the surveys? Mm -hmm. About the surveys? Or in terms of uh, the media campaign? No, no, we did not do that. It's all sort of environmental. Yeah, it's all environmental. Yeah, it's so, like TV, but there's radio. nothing directed to like the last name Nguyen no, address. We no, we didn't. We're going to mail. No, we didn't do that. And you haven't, have you worked with any Medicaid health plans yet? To to do that sort of thing, to, to, direct uh, mail. to do direct mail. Because they have ethnicity data on yeah. a significant portion of people. No, we have a very 
Uh, one of the things that, that, that there's actually, I didn't even talk about this, we're not even sure when they said they had a test or not. Or <laughs> that, or, it's also, I mean, it's just like, you know, yeah. from, from the self-report, I mean, and because they don't know the difference between B and C and the cholesterol test and all that stuff. So <laughs> it's actually a, one of our colleagues up in Seattle did a nice little paper on validation, FFP testing, and got it published. And, you know, it was kind of weird because, like, they're like, it's not reliable. We're like, this is our outcome. So, <laughs> so, so, this is how it goes. So, um, so uh, happy free, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Uh, it's been done since 2007, uh, mostly in English and Chinese. Actually, when they did their campaign, they went to us with our campaign to, to link to the Vietnamese, but they didn't have the capacity to do the Vietnamese piece. Mm -hmm. So we actually combined our campaign with theirs in San Francisco. And then there's this MSCO HEPI quality improvement collaborative, which I'll talk about a little bit here. Uh, the HEPI free campaign, I think it's a public awareness campaign. It's not just media, but it's really a media and community mobilization uh, approach. Uh, it started with the Department of Public Health, Asian Free Foundation, and Asian Media Center at Stanford. Uh, they did all these kinds of things, and you know, since I showed you pictures about people lying down in the streets at the beginning, there are people in the streets again, uh, you know, working for their community, uh, doing these kinds of uh, activities. Uh, they actually did a very nice job of getting uh, power people to play. And I think that that to me was really major. You know, Fiona Ma, who's a state assembly woman, uh, took on this. Um, you know, their their fun gathering event. You see, you know, the literati from you know, San Francisco political. So they're very good at doing that kind of work. But we're not at all. <laughs> so, uh, so these good things. This is their famous campaign that actually got written up in the New York Times. Hmm. Which one deserves to die? It's the idea that one out of ten has it. Uh, you put ten people out there and you ask which one deserves to die. They have doctors. They recognize lots of like Robert Hughes in there. Yeah. Uh, and then they had beauty queens, so they did all this stuff. It was quite tropical. It's somewhat controversial with these Asian American communities. Uh, a few other things. And then, you know, sort of the next step was uh, Heavy Free. Uh, actually, they came to us, actually, to me, and said, we want to take the next step. And we were like, okay, what's your logic model? What are you doing? Like, oh, we don't really have a logic model. So we sat down and, you know, helped them work out a logic model. And they didn't like it, actually. <laughs> They're like, we don't, think about it. we don't think about the world this way. <laughs> it was like, you like, have to think about the world this way. You want to write some grants. So, okay, we'll think about the world this way. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the where we really created this uh, group called the FIB Quality Improvement Collaborative, with, uh, which is actually led by uh, Kevin Grumbach and CTSI, uh, along with FIB Free. Uh, and we are basically, the idea was, look, we've done all these community-based work, it's time now to go to the clinic. Because, first of all, we don't know whether they've been tested or not. It turns out that when you do free testing, it's very funny, I went to a free testing site, I saw two of my patients there, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I tested you already. Like, I'm to test. So, in the community, it's kind of weird. It's so weird, you know, it's just really weird. And so we're like, you know what, we need to go to where the doctors and the patients yes. are, okay? Because, you know, <laughs> what? Yeah, no, it's a good idea. <laughs> so so we've we, we got at all these clinic, you know, the major clinical, the, the, actually the concept behind having hip DQIC is actually very interesting beyond hip DQIC. It's like saying, okay, here's a disease we can eliminate. You know, we all believe that this is possible, right? So let's do a citywide elimination campaign. That's, that's what Hep B Free is about. And so now, but now we've done all this community-based work, let's go to the clinic, see what the doctors are doing. You know? And they were very nervous about doing it because they don't have any clinical experience. CTSI brought the clinical experience to the table and we brought all these people in. Uh, it turns out Kaiser already has a Hep B registry ahead of all of us. And they actually have a nurse who sort of helps to see how, and it's very rudimentary, uh, a disease management program, they have one. NAMS already has a Hep B registry. They don't have much of an intervention. Uh, CHN now is beginning to do their sort of quality improvement issues. Uh, New CSF has nothing, <laughs> as always. It's actually, I'm pretty ashamed about doing this very research when I'm in the tail because you said, because we're like the worst. <laughs> like, I'm doing all this great work in the community, but if I'm in my clinic, I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> we're doing a really bad job here. So. True. What? Sad but true. Yeah, so there we are. So, um, I don't want to, this is actually a study that we did in CSF to show that we weren't doing so good, <laughs> so I don't talk about too much. Cindy Lyon did this little, do you remember STORE? Yeah. STORE is a ter ter terrible system to do research with, but we did a project that got published out of STORE, uh, and we found that, you know, screening rates were kind of like what we thought, 40 to 60%. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't, I wasn't going to only show one study that Mandana and I did, although it's mostly Mandana's work, not mine, but uh, this is just hot off the, the press. Um, this actually has to do with happy management. 
So this is two things on this paper. This is a survey of the providers here in, uh, in CHN uh, about how they monitor people with hepatitis B. And uh, basically, they use ALT, AST a lot, not RMO, not so much. This is by their report. And then um, when they look at the medical records, uh, Madame and her team did, uh, these are happy infected patients. So these are some of the usual quality of care metrics for these patients. Have they been screened for Hep A, 81%? Not too bad. Have they been vaccinated for Hepatitis A, 24%? Uh, were they screened for Hep C, 2, 35%? Uh, were they screened for HIV, 31%? Did they get a AOT within 12 months, which is like the bare minimum for a Hep B infected patient? 75%, so not great, not, not bad. Um, HPV viral load ever, they probably should need to get, at least get once ever, 47%. And liver cancer screening only 51 percent. And I'm just going to finish in the next couple of minutes uh, on this new study that we're doing. So, first thing that I wanted to show you was that I, I did this through a very rough uh, PubMed search on controlled trial in Asian Americans for the last uh, 22 years. There were 57 studies that were non drug advice. Four dealt with MP, but they were all in the community. Uh, only 11 actually have healthcare providers for patients. So, the point I'm making here is. We do a lot of healthcare intervention, healthcare communication studies, and I'm sure a lot of studies that you guys do have Asian Americans in it. So, but if you don't say it, then I couldn't find it uh, in, the, uh, in the search. But studies that focus on Asian Americans only, there's only 11 studies, very few on um, this. And we looked at Hep C screening, there were very few anywhere. Uh, so I think there were four, two out of New York or something like that, for any group actually. So, so then we wrote this grant that was just recently funded by McCord. Um, our team, uh, we're actually going to do it at UCSF and Center Street General Hospital. Uh, our team at UCSF is me, uh, Judith Walsh, and Jen So, who's in psychology. We have about 700 Asian patients, and their screening rate is sort of showing you 40 to 45%. Uh, the general and CHN is going to be led by the pandemic, and it's um, 15,000 uh, Asian patients. We think, I think the number that we're going to give you is 44% of the screen. Uh, so we still have uh, rooms to move on this. Uh, and we actually have a, a series of stakeholders, including some of the uh, the idea is to develop an intervention uh, consisting of a, a patient education video uh, and a provider alert uh, to screen, increase screening of both B and C. Um, the C is the appropriate uh, age cohort. Uh, and then to evaluate in a, a group randomized controlled trial. So this is the model that we were working on. So basically, focusing on patient and provider more than system, but the intervention is going to look at patients who are watch a video bring a provider alert to the doctor so the interaction is being dealt with. And then the provider actually gets a panel notification every six months that uh, the patient's not been screened. Um, the way that we'll do this is going to be an iPad app uh, with branching logic linking to videos. We'll do it in English, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Uh, the provider alert will be printed out by the iPad app, and then the panel notification will be just plugged in. This is a prototype we created to do this. This is actually on a regular laptop, not a, uh, on a tablet computer. And I'm just going to sort of skip through all this. I think the main thing is that uh, we're going to be doing focus groups. We're going to try to work on not just creating intervention and testing, but also thinking about sustainability. And my, my feeling about this is that whatever the, whether or not this works or not, I think what I want to do is to <coughs> see how these kind of patient-centered uh, interventions can be incorporated into clinical care uh, for diverse communities. And again, you know, I think you'd probably be more ahead of it. Then you guys have kiosks and all kinds of stuff. We don't have any of this stuff in the so we'll see if you have So the so rationale to actually combine is, is if I'm screening, am I doing one and I'm doing both B and C, or is the rationale, how, how do you think about B and C? Because I think about those separate, differently. Do yeah. you, in this intervention, are they the same and I'm screening for viral hepatitis, or? Um, I think it's sort of tailored to the patient. So if the patient walks in and they're in the right age group, then they'll be asked, they'll be asking the doctor, oh, I'm at risk for B, can you test me for it? And I'm at risk for C, can you test me for it? And some patients will come in and they will be qualifying for C, at least by the recommendation of 1945, 1965. So they'll only be asking for B. Now the provider can think about it however he or she wants, right? I mean, the provider might go, I'm just going to check B and C for everybody, mm -hmm. um, depending on how the system works. Speaking of the system, actually, this issue came about and that we haven't worked on an algorithm in sort of managing the patients. Uh, 
Kendrick just said, uh, for testing patients and monitoring hepatitis B and C. And it's going to be disseminated in fact, the next week. I'm going to be talking to the primary care groups about that, which is C and alpha. And it does actually, for the hep B, uh, suggest that you could use the testing for hep B as a potential risk factor, also check for hep C, which is not traditionally what we do because unless it's risk factor related, we don't, and an age cohort is another risk factor now that's come up with hep C, but not every, but that one actually says everything. And I don't know how in the end that came about, but I think that may potentially at some point influence the results that we get, just like what you saw in the media campaign and there were, Oh yeah, I'll show, you my, I'll show you the challenges we got. Yeah, so just, you know, that was, that was a decision made at the hospital. No, there was a, there was a, uh, there was a, yeah, no, but there was a group of sort of a, a QI, sort of quality improvement committee uh, designated. I mean, we've been working on this for two and a half years. Yeah. Sort of specialist yeah. primary care provider yeah. champions who are kind got of, it, got and it, then it. at the end, so it, I think in the end it became a little bit confusing, and I don't know, it just, I don't know how this came about because I was trying to fix that. But um, essentially, when, when it was Hep C, test for Hep B, and it became a reverse too, that is Hep, it's hep B, test everyone for Hep C. Now, it isn't going to harm anyone in that there's going to yeah. be a proportion of people. And also, with, with Asians, we have such new data on reading. On hep C. And the risk factors are not traditional. Yeah. It could be tattoos, it could be you know, sort of going to the nail um, uh, salons, things like that. And so, and we know that they're different, actually, such that you know, the traditional risk factors don't don't apply, and so it may be a very good thing that we will understand what actually gets prevalent yeah. in our population. Yeah, it's not bad, but it's just, it's, it is now become, it may become yeah. part of what we do on a daily basis. Right, no, I understand. Yeah. So, we'll do uh, provide randomized control trial for the two sites, uh, and then we'll recruit all patients. Um, again, th this is a project that's going to be in English, Chinese, and Vietnamese, so we'll take all Chinese speakers, all Vietnamese speakers, and all Asians who speak. And we'll look at their actual documented, instead of their self-reported hep B testing outcome. Uh, and then we'll, at the end, actually, I think we, we built a lot of this stuff in, like we're going to be talking to the providers and patients afterwards to understand, you know, how things work, but also if they did work, uh, how we can keep it going. And, and, and can I ask some very interesting, since this is a very grand, maybe you've built this in already, in your follow-up assessments of patients uh -huh. to assess um, quality of life and anxiety related to positive results that, that put you at risk but don't mean that you have cancer, right? I mean, how do positive results in an asymptomatic person affect a person's quality of life? I think the yeah, equipoise, think about that. equipoise around that, I think people are going to be really interested in. Yeah. That's a great, you know, that's actually actual one of our struggle. I put on my challenges. The big, the, the big uh, sort of conceptual struggle that we're having is incorporating patient center, center perspectives when the intervention is already recommended, you know, it's, it's not like PSA testing, right? You know, it's easy to do PSA center, patient centered for PSA testing because that's what it's supposed to be, right? You're supposed right. to talk to them, but, but this, is, public this is like public health. They said you're supposed to do it. So how do you bring the patient centered perspective right. into it? And I think one of that, I, I think that that's a great idea. But I think that's that's a key idea. I have to say that's one of the things that the task force struggled with for both. For both B, well B isn't out yet, but for C, for sure B, is because when you have this thing where the, the outcomes are terrible in, in interventions, but, but still the likelihood of any given screened person testing positive and being right. being at risk of those outcomes is still low. low. Yeah. And yeah. that, so you have to think a lot about all of that. Yeah, so the, the good news is that, you know, I think, I think we need to look at that, but I think treatment is better. Yeah, treatment for B is better. So at least, as far as that's concerned, treatment is the treatment is better. Yeah. But I, the treatment is better, and that's I think what shifted the recommendation. But it still doesn't mean that communication about risk and anxiety is not there because it's. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, this is true for almost any screening test we do. Right? So I mean, like breast cancer screening. So for example, if, you know, if someone gets a positive mammogram, that's a huge problem, right? I mean, it's yeah. He, most of it turned out to be not cancer, right? But you go through a month or two of basically terrible waiting for the results to come. Sure. I'm speaking this from this from personal experience. I mean it's like it's terrible to have absolutely not one mm -hmm. And so um, so I think this is a really important point that, that what happens once you do population wide screening, what are some of the groups and how do they feel about it afterwards? Mm -hmm. um, sorry. I would be very curious to incorporate interpreter perspectives into this uh, or to yeah. find out what Interesting. Interpreter. Interpreter. You know, I would just say that when I've tried to talk about things like um, 
see ultrasound or the results of it. Boy, do I not know exactly how I'm saying it and how it's being interpreted. <laughs> and like What's fumbling around the words patient? about tumors, mass, cancer. I mean, it's like crazy how uncomfortable all of us are feeling in those conversations. And I speak as someone who can't speak any language other than English. And um, I know that it's actually harder for me with my Cantonese speaking, Vietnamese speaking, particularly because I'm going through Pacific instead of our local interpreters. But even Why? if I could know what's the right spiel to give for each stage of the process, particularly when it gets more tricky with the screening stuff, with the like liver ultrasound, the results of the ultrasound, the, I would love to know what the interpreters think it's of what we're saying, saying yeah. and then what they're saying. And, what yeah. they feel comfortable with, because often I feel like they're they're experiencing issues struggling with the stigma of the language too, yeah. and that maybe they're trying to soften or harshen based on what I don't know word, but what they think. That sounds like a great core you bring. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not just about FB; it's about pretty much everything, right? Yeah. So I mean, but I think I think in this project, what we're not we're not dealing with that too much, simply yeah. because I think. We're teaching the patient in their language right. the way that we think they should be told right. about tests, and then and then they'll right. go and talk to the doctor, and then of course whatever happens there. Well, I mean, I even think so, showing that video yeah. to interpreters is not even a research thing, but it's an educational piece so that they know the background of things. Like I think they would be really fascinated as the people who work here to know those things. So in fact, so I, I can give you some perspective because I deal with that all the time. Yeah. Such, I see the spectrum of most of the lesions and this and that, such that it really becomes critical as to how you get the information. But I can tell you that since we have now gone through Pacific you know, translation, yeah. the lot, a lot of those individualized discussions, and sometimes I would even start the conversation with a translator that we had in person who was sitting and living in the liver clinic, yeah. we had like several, right, right. would actually carry on the rest of it for me. I right. wouldn't even say the rest of it, and I'd be like, okay, now he's just finishing off what I needed to say. Right. And um, and so for those cases, I just for sure avoid the Pacific translation. So I know that there is absolutely for sure there's difference because the patients ask me several times, and I know the level of understanding is not there. So I actually ask for the BMI. I ask for that in person. Yeah. In person, the more difficult, obviously, but the BMI and it's like face to face. Yeah. So I think we have to kind of as physicians, we may want to be sort of yeah. individualizing yeah. that. Depending kind of what kind of you, you, I mean, the I content think what is. you said, yeah. Madonna, is super important. It's it, and and I loathe the Pacific Convention. Yeah, it's so and, true. It and like, you know, but but <laughs> we just don't have the luxury in primary Which care of, of waiting for a BMI or an in person interpreter. And it's like if I have six more patients to see. You know, I, I certainly can't. feel your challenge. It's the same for us. I mean, we have a 35 patient clinic, and we only had a half an hour. I mean, half a day, half a day of 35 patients. Yeah. And so I agree with you that that's absolutely the challenge here. And it used to be so much easier when there was an in-person person. They go in, in and out of the rooms, and we would be done. Uh -huh. um, but I think every time that I've asked them, um, you know, they have been very receptive. If I just said this is a sensitive conversation that I do need an in-person one, within minutes they've gotten me. Now, I don't know if it's because it's a specialty and they, they kind of understand that there's discussions that go into cancers and things like that are really difficult, um, that it happens, but they've been very receptive. So, so I've sort of individualized my practice to them. Um, I, 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 it sounds to me like there are a couple of ways you can handle this issue. I think one from a research perspective, but the other is sort of, you know, maybe we need to have some kind of standardized well, information I mean, about yeah. what it means to get an ultrasound, what it means to get a you know, diagnosis or sort of an unknown diagnosis and you have to follow it up. I mean, we can probably do that yeah. uh, easily. I mean, so. that on an iPad to me as a clinician would be invaluable. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's be specific about what you just said. Like, well, what, you know. What do you want on it? What do I want on <laughs> it? <laughs> this, is, this is my, you know, my dreaming, but I'd love to be able to, um, you know, and visit the captains after, after, if I have a non-English speaking patient who has a positive viral hepatitis, Results. Uh -huh. um, I will bring them in for a sooner follow up because I don't feel like I can call them up on the phone and talk about it. I see. So, I for that follow up visit, wouldn't it be nice to have some standardized communication uh, about what your positive result That's means? right. Okay. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. That would be. We yeah. pick the right language, language for it because I know yeah. that I'm searching for the right words to be comfortable with, yeah. and I barely have that in English. Yes. And then to, to know what the right terms are that will be culturally appropriate, but but accurate. accurate. Mm -hmm. 
that's where I think I struggle and then where I feel like I'm probably fussing around and I bet the interpreter is trying to help me out in some way and I don't know what would be the best way of doing it. Yeah. Oh. I was thinking, like, you know what? So you're running this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're gonna, <laughs> a few questions and we're going to stop. But, yeah. Okay, I was just wondering what they uh, do at Kaiser because I, in general, when there's something comes up, you know, an issue, a health issue for you, it seems like to me they're always saying, okay, now go to this uh, video and, you know, yeah. a little class. They always have a video. video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there's an expert there who talks. I, I think this is not a hard problem. Right. Yeah, it's you just need a video. Solution. You've been diagnosed with hepatitis B. Right. What does it mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I guess I'm wondering. You gave the example of the PSA test, which really is a shared decision making process. Here, this is a public health intervention. Why not compare? And I know you got your P. Corey grant already, but why not compare the video doctor, which is engaged the patient, engaged the doctor, talk about it, decide to what, what we mostly do in clinic, which is for things that are recommended, the, the medical assistant just doesn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they say, oh, your patient doesn't want the flu shot. And then we talk about it. Mm -hmm. But one of them is more top-down, and one of them is more patient-centered. And I guess I'm wondering, from a Pete Corey standpoint, isn't that the research question that would be of greatest interest? For a public health intervention. For us as clinicians and patients and health systems. So look at a system intervention. Basically, the, the, the MEA says this person is yeah. of a risk category, has yeah. not gotten yeah. heavy screening, yeah. fill out the paper or enter into the computer, yeah. and let we, we sort of try to do that in the control group with provider notification and let the doctor decide. Because we, we were nervous about saying anything about having a system intervention because we don't do that in the UCSF. In other words, our MAs don't. We know that. Have yeah. that be, for us to propose it, it's pretty tricky. Yeah, it'd be like, the, the administrator would be like, why? <laughs> That kind of stuff. But but I think you're right. I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing I want to do is, okay, you're going to have this quality, this usual QI thing. Why don't we compare it to something that actually involves patients? Right, right, right. Great. Why don't I have the last slide? Yeah, the last one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just interested in your opinion because I think you and I have not discussed this ever before. I think it's really interesting to also hear about all the other experts' opinions and what they think about this. But I'm interested in your opinion because I think you and I have not discussed this ever before. I think it's really interesting to also hear about all the other experts' opinions. If I'm just attended a medical student-driven, and those are actually the kind of sessions um, that had to do with health disparity and, uh, and the issue of how uh, cost and systems approaches and, and the reality of what we deal with, especially with the Obamacare that's coming in place, is going to impact how we would practice. And one of the articles that was, that was there for everyone to read um, was Molly Cook's uh, paper on the issue that you know, perhaps pr as much as we are interested in patient-centered approach, that there has to also be some component of decision making based on the global costs and, and how, like, you know, mm -hmm. for the physicians to be kind of uncomfortable with that issue as, as we advocate obviously for our patients on an individual basis, but thinking of the bigger picture. And that perhaps the patient-centered approaches are not going to be the kind of um, approaches that we really are sustainable in the future. That it has to be some place component. And I'm just wondering, um, from your is that perspective, you're talking about cost then? Cost cost. And, and just in general, you know, how are we going to maintain our healthcare uh, system-wide quality that we have currently, recognizing that it's limited, you know, amount of resources, and and should we actually now be making sort of interventions by which we're, we're having not so much of a patient-centered approach as much as a mixed kind of yeah. situation. Yeah, I mean, this I, I, you know, this is a statement of faith. I think our patients are better than we think they are. In other words, if you explain them carefully and understood their goals of care, they may often choose the less costly path. And I, I think that's the problem, is that sometimes when you don't have enough time to spend with them, you imagine you're in sort of a vulnerable situation and someone offers you something. You're going to take the most things that are being done possible. You know, that's, I think that's a lot of reason why our patients say, choose antibiotics for, for colds. You know, they're, like, they're, they're seeing the doctor, they can't come back to see them, blah, 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 they're just going to take that. But if you spend enough time telling them the way that they can understand it, they may actually end up choosing But them. in this case, is screening a cost-effective intervention? I would imagine. Uh, I think, I think, um, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think this is still a challenge. So right. yeah. screening in general is always a challenge. This, That's right. I think this one is, is slightly different still than the cancer one. The cancer one is like the, 
oh my God, it's, you know, what do you do with all these false positives and you have more and more, more testing. This yeah. is like you screen and then you have a, you have yeah. a diagnosis. Right. And now there's a whole range of things you could do with right. that diagnosis. Right. And that requires all you these things that you're taught down. you could do. There's a whole range, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I think the challenge for the hospital in trying to think about do we adopt the task force screenings is that a lot of that means expensive medicines that are changing every single month of, of what the new approved medicines are. Not everyone would actually want to. Who is it that should be? There's, those are all shifting guidelines. And so the thing that starts as public health screening still leads to a whole range of things yeah. that could happen after that, that yeah, I think yeah. required, that's where the patient-centered well, approach the is survey, like, how do you communicate those types of be things? interesting in the post-survey and sort of say, okay, you've been diagnosed with this, which one of these things would you be interested in? Daily medications for the rest of your life? Well, we're going to do post-intervention focus groups, so yeah. I think some of these issues may come out better right. in, in sort of qualitative work than quantitative work. But I think that's important. I think the idea of, if you had it, what does it mean? Right. Did you get adequate communication right. about that? From the patient's point of view, yeah. I think you're raising a different issue, which is from a system point of view. Can we really afford to find out that we have another hundred, you know, fifty thousand yeah. happy positive but I, patients? But I know? think they're related yeah. because I think patients wouldn't necessarily always choose, you know, all right. the whole set of things. And there's there's a rationale right. for screening, even if it's for monitoring. Right. Right. So, but, right. but anyway. Well, thank you very much. All right, this has been really terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you.